Well, here we go. I'm a little gloomy this morning. There we go. Maybe a little bit off in here. Oh. Well, as they say, we're going to jump today out of the frying pan into the fire. We are definitely arriving in the deep end of the pool. <laughs> I'll say that. Um, and yeah. <laughs> so we are continuing in our detailed look at the Gospel of John. And, and today we arrive at just one of those special moments in Scripture where, where we see things that we see nowhere else. Literally, um, and particularly in this in this seventeenth chapter, we see the relationship between Jesus and his Father expanded and deepened uh, in ways that we can't see elsewhere in Scripture. This is, of course, the seventeenth chapter is Jesus's prayer uh, after he has just concluded the farewell discourse, and as he as he prays. Um, he shares details that are, are unique in Scripture. And this is also by far the longest prayer of Jesus's that we see anywhere in Scripture, too. But just so we get the context of where this is at, uh, Jesus has just finished his farewell discourse, um, a message that had been completed as we, uh, as we looked at chapters 14, 15, and 16, uh, that message included uh, sort of a last word of encouragement for his disciples. Um, it included uh, Jesus addressing many needs and concerns and dangers that they were going to be facing in their future. And then he identified specific dangers and risks that the disciples would be subject to. And he sort of put that all under the umbrella of what it was going to be like for them living in the world um, and, and the challenges they were going to face. But he didn't leave them alone. He also made promises to them as he talked with them. And he said, here are some things that are going to help uh, mitigate those risks or help you handle those risks as they come to you. Um, he, he promised them help, and particularly he promised them help in the form of the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. Um, he promised them eternal security, not that they would enjoy uh, what was going, I shouldn't, I shouldn't use that word, not that they wouldn't be endangered by things in this world, but their, but their eternal security was uh, guaranteed. He, he shared with them that what they're going to be feeling over the next few hours, the next couple of days, they were going to be incredibly sorrowful. But that would all transition into, a, into a, an emotion and a, a period of great joy. And then he talked a lot about the fact that there would be this intense and tight fellowship between Jesus, his father, and those disciples who were gathered in that room with him that evening. Uh, and once Jesus had completed his mission of, of, of bringing atonement and salvation, that this would restore them into a, a new, wonderful relationship with uh, their Heavenly Father. So, now, as he has concluded that discussion with his disciples, Jesus begins to pray. And as he begins to pray, he looks in both directions. He looks both backwards and forwards. He looks back over what they have just covered in the last three chapters. He looks over this discussion that's just now ending. And what he does is he turns what they've talked about, he turns those same topics into a prayer. But now instead of addressing the disciples with those concerns and those promises, he takes this to his father. And, 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 and asks him for many of those same things. And he, he makes this appeal to God. And it's all about the future of these men and their mission and what they're, what they're, what they're uh, going to experience. He identifies once again a lot of the same needs that he's talked about in chapters 14 through 16. And then he prays to his Heavenly Father for those specific needs. But also Jesus in this 
in this prayer, he looks forward as well. And he looks not so much at what's going to happen in the next few hours. He looks past that. He looks past his agony. He looks past his suffering. He looks through those things and he never asks for anything here uh, to, to, to simplify or to limit the pain that he's going to experience. There's no request even remotely like that here. Instead, he looks through all of that and what he is focused on is his triumph and his glory and his joy and the resolution of the problem for which he came to earth in the first place. So Jesus never asks for anything to help him endure what's going, this, this grueling experience that he's going to undergo. What we see in the Synoptic Gospels that happens in Gethsemane doesn't even show up in this prayer. This prayer is not focused on that. It's not focused on his suffering. It's focused on his glory. And that's what it's all about. And so the focus here is really not on himself. It's about providing the support that these disciples need. And a lot of times this is called Jesus' priestly prayer. And you'll see that in many outlines. You'll see it in the headings in some Bibles and things like that. It'll, it'll refer to this as Jesus' priestly prayer. I'm going to stay away from that terminology and let me see if I can explain why. Um, first of all, the sacrifice, the atonement that Jesus is going to make for the world has not yet been completed. And for a priestly role, that's what it's all about. You know, it's, it's about making that sacrifice. Now, Jesus is going to do that, but he doesn't pray about that. And he doesn't pray about their salvation and their atonement. Instead, he prays about their common mission and where they are headed once the atonement is completed. And so we're going to call this, instead of the priestly prayer, we're going to just simply call this the farewell prayer. Okay? Um, and that's because this, the content of this prayer is directly related to what Jesus has just said in the farewell discourse. So that's the terminology we're going to use. And what Jesus is doing here is turning the responsibility for the ongoing work, for the ongoing mission, he's turning that back to his heavenly father because he's going to be leaving the earth. And so that's what we see happening here. Okay, what's the chapter look like? Well, there's a lot of different ways that we can organize it. It begins with Jesus praying uh, for his glorification. Okay, that's where it starts. And then the next long section in the majority of the chapter are sections where Jesus prays for these disciples, uh, for his apostles. And we're, we're going to just briefly address that right now. For all intents and purposes, we're not talking about all of Jesus' disciples here. We're talking about the 11, um, because Judas is no longer numbered with them. He has left earlier in the morning. So this is the 11, the eyewitnesses, those who will take what they have seen, what they've heard, and they're going to take that out to the rest of the world uh, once Jesus has left. Um, let's see, where are we? Okay, so in the beginning, of that, that's verses 6 through 19, as Jesus prays for his disciples, for his apostles. That begins with a discussion of their devotion and how they are devoted. And what that does is it provides Jesus with a grounds to present to his father. We want to we want to remember here that the primary audience in this chapter is not us. It's not even the disciples. The audience that Jesus, the person Jesus is speaking to, is his heavenly Father, and so that's what we need to remember. And so he begins this section of the prayer by giving the reasons that he thinks his Father should honor the requests he's making. And the reason that he gives is because these disciples have already come a long ways. Okay? The second thing that he's going to pray for in verses 11 through 16 is he's going to specifically pray for their protection and for their preservation as they live in the world. And then the third thing he's going to pray for in verses 17 through 19 is their sanctification. We'll talk more later about exactly what that means in this context. But um, that, those, are the, those are the key points that he's going to make as he prays for the apostles. Now, 
The last thing that he's going to speak of in this prayer is he's going to pray for all future believers, which of course includes us in today's world. And we can be thankful for this. And he's gonna do that by beginning with a prayer for unity. And then he's going to pray about experiencing a future reunion or being back together again in a new way. Uh, that he, will, he wants to be uh, with those who are what he calls his own. And then the last thing I want to talk to you about just briefly here as we read through this, yes, the primary audience is God, but he also intended for this prayer to be heard by those disciples and by us, okay? He intended for that, and this was not new for Jesus. You, you may recall back in chapter 11 at Lazarus' tomb, Jesus made a comment. He said at that time, he, he, he looked up to heaven and he said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. Jesus would sometimes pray, but he had a secondary audience. And we need to put ourselves, we are, we are included in that secondary audience. Uh, as, as we look at Jesus praying to his Father, but think about what it must have meant to those apostles to have been there and heard this, and specifically the things Jesus is going to say about them. Because this is not a time, this is not the criticism that we saw at the end of chapter 16, where Jesus warned them, you're all going to desert me. That's not here. What's here is how far they have come, how good, what, what good progress they have made and how devoted they are to Jesus and to his Father. And so it's, it's really, it's an, incredible, um, it's an incredible moment and we have a window into it. So we'll watch that and as we work our way through the text, because the text is challenging, the text is very challenging. As we work our way through here, there'll be several points where I just ask you to stop and think what it must have meant to those ears to have heard that live um, as, as Jesus prayed specifically for them. Do you have something, Lamar? No. Okay, I thought you had a question a second ago. All right, so here we go. We're going to start then into chapter 17. We'll do this first section, uh, verses 1 through 5. And in this section, this is the section where Jesus prays for his glorification. And the reason he prays for this glorification is because he will have completed his mission, what he came to do. Um, part of that has already been finished. He has shown the Father to the world. But yet, the, the business of, at of atoning for the sins of the world still lies in front of him. Okay? And so, what I want, one of the things I want for you to watch as we read these five verses is watch how much it sounds like the work is already done. And in Jesus' mind, it was. In Jesus' mind, it was. But he sounds, as he's saying this, he sounds as if it's already done, and, and, and it's just, you know, it's just to be identified, okay? But also, here's a question for you as we read for this. What is there, a, Jesus is going to ask his Father that he be glorified, that Jesus be glorified. What is it that keeps that from being just a selfish request on Jesus' part? Saying, okay, I want the world to look at me. What is it that keeps that from being selfish, okay? Here we go. Here's uh, verses 1 through 5. <clears throat> After Jesus said this, and what he's talking about, of course, is this whole farewell discourse. After Jesus completed saying these things, he looked toward heaven and he prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. That's where it sounds like he's all done. Okay? He still has the crucifixion in front of him. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Okay? So let's begin. Verse 1. First thing Jesus says is the time has come. 
Remember, John has painted us a picture from the beginning of the book, and it began with, my time is not now, it's not yet. But ever since chapter 12 and verse 3, the time has arrived. And that, that moment was after Jesus entered back into Jerusalem for his final time, the triumphal entry, and Jesus announced at that point, he said, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And so at this critical moment, Jesus identifies this is a time for prayer. And it reflects on his absolute and total dependence on his Father. It makes me wonder how we approach times of prayer and times of need. Are we that transparent to God? Will we admit that we are that needy to God? Or do most of the time we rely on ourselves? That's just an aside. <clears throat> Jesus said to his father, he said, glorify your son. That just simply means to bring honor and bring praise to Jesus. This is the only self-oriented self request that Jesus makes in this whole prayer. This is the only thing he says. But, but the point is, that's not the end point. That's, it's not the point to bring glory to himself. It's not a self-serving request because what's going to happen is he, as he sees it and he reveals this as he's speaking to his father, he says, as I am glorified, it will really serve to glorify God, to glorify you. That's what he says. He says, glorify your son that your son may glorify you. Verse 2. Verse 2 describes what the objective is in the mission that Jesus has received from his father. And this, is, this gets a little challenging here to try to put these verses together and make them cohesive. But something that helps is if you look at verse 2, at least in the NIV, the first word is for. That's not a good word. Many of the old, more literal translations use a phrase like, just as, something like that. So it's setting up a comparison or a similarity between what he said in verse one and what he says in verse two. Okay, so there's a, there's a connection between those two things. Okay, and it shows up in the, in the, in the best translations in the language. And, and what, this, what each verse has is it begins with a primary action and then there's a resulting action, okay? So in verse 1, the primary action was God giving glory to Jesus, which is what Jesus has asked him for. Father, glorify your son. That's the primary action that he's requesting. But what's the secondary action, what the resulting action is, is if, if that is done, then your son will glorify the Father. So that's the way this sentence is set up. Now look at the second sentence, the second verse. And you'll see the same type of, let's see, that's verse one. God glorifies Jesus is the primary action. Jesus glorifies God is the resulting action. Okay? Now in the second verse, the primary action is God giving authority to Jesus. And the resulting action is Jesus will then dispense eternal life to mankind, to people, okay? So there's verse one and there's verse two. The primary action in verse one was God glorifying Jesus. The primary action in verse two is God giving authority to Jesus. The resulting actions are in verse one that Jesus will glorify God. And in verse two, what it results in is Jesus, because he has that authority, Jesus is able to then dispense eternal life to those whom he chooses. Now, there's another thing that's similar between, or that's compared between verses one and verse two. In verse one, think about the focus of that verse and what Jesus is really talking about. And what Jesus is talking about in verse one is he's talking about God's role and responsibility in salvation, in accomplishing salvation. 
And what his responsibility was, was to put the son in that position to do his work. It's all God's plan. Okay? And so verse 1 tells us about God's role in salvation. Verse 2 tells us about Jesus' role in salvation. All right? And, Je and Jesus' role is then to take the authority given to him by God and use that authority to dispense eternal life or to administer eternal life or to give eternal life. And so those are the, um, those are the things that, uh, that we see emphasized in those two verses. Jesus says that he has been given authority over, and it says all people in the NIV, but, but some of the old, more traditional translations say all flesh. Just to, just to point out that that means all people, all mankind. Jesus has authority over everybody, but that doesn't mean everybody is going to get eternal life. It means that those whom he chooses um, by his protocol, those are the ones he will dispense eternal life to. And so now if you take those, those two verses and we try to move them together, this is what you end up with. If you combine one and two, what we're looking at is God's role in salvation, Jesus' role in salvation. Jesus is giving eternal life to humans, to mankind, brings glory to God. And that's how this whole thing fits together. And that's the structure upon which this whole prayer is organized, is this fact that as Jesus gives eternal life, that brings great glory to God himself. All right. Um, I wanted to talk for just a second about Jesus having authority over all flesh. Uh, we've seen that already in John. You'll recall from chapter 3, this is when he's speaking to Nicodemus. And afterwards, John, the apostle, gave some commentary. And in that commentary, he said, The Father loves the Son and has placed all things in his hands. In chapter 13, just as Jesus is strapping the towel on and getting ready to wash feet, um, John says that Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. And so he proceeded then to wash their feet. You can compare this statement that he has authority over all flesh with what we, what we know from Matthew 28 and 18, where Jesus said, all authority, all power on heaven and on earth is given to me. But only some of those will inherit eternal life. And those people who inherit eternal life will be those who have been given uh, to the Son by the Father. Again, if we look back at the discussion with Nicodemus, who's going to get eternal life? Well, it's going to be those who have been born again from above. And that doesn't include the whole world. That only includes, in fact, a small subset of the world. But those are the ones who will inherit eternal life. Okay. Now, verse 3. Verse 3 is then a combination of verses 1 and 2. And really verses 3, 4, and 5 follow directly from verses 1 and 2. And what Jesus says in verse 3 is that eternal life is a result of knowing the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. And, and John has made pains, uh, has taken pains throughout his book to emphasize that you can't have one without the other. You can't have the Father and not accept the Son and you can't have the Son without attributing Him and all of His work to the Father. So they are, they are part of the same package. And the thing is, He's not just talking in verse 3 when He says, Now this is eternal life that they may know you. This is not just an intellectual knowledge. This is a heart knowledge. This is, this is, um, this is a, a trusting knowledge. This is a loving knowledge. This is an obedient knowledge. This is a relationship knowledge. This is what, Je what, what Jesus is talking about as he prays. He's not praying that people will know him in an intellectual sense and a, a logical sense and be able to reason only. That is the initial thing that, that people have to gain when, when we speak of them gaining faith. But ultimately, it's got to get deeper than that. 
It's got to get to the heart. And it's got to mean trusting, it's got to mean loving, it's got to mean obeying, it's got to mean uh, enjoying his company and, 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 and doing whatever's necessary to remain in his company. Okay? Now, look also at something here that's a little bit strange about this verse. And I'll admit to you freely, as we get into chapter 17, there are as many questions that I have after, after studying this. I have as many questions as I do answers, believe me. Probably more. But here's one that, that I think is, uh, is, is, is interesting. And that's in verse 3. Notice how Jesus refers to himself in the third person. He says, now this is eternal life, Father, that they may know you and Jesus Christ. He doesn't say me. He says, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And I asked myself, why did he choose to use the third person here? I'm going to do it after the last 10 minutes since I read it. <laughs> you know, is, is, he, is he been part of the Godhead? Is this what we're looking at here? Because Jesus really is God? Does he see himself as God? And, you know, Jesus Christ is just one way he's presented him to it? I don't know. Well, you could start with this, I think. Um, I think part of what he's doing is he's identifying with his human humanness. And that is what humans will call him, is Jesus Christ. And so he's identifying so closely with these 11 as he speaks to his father, he almost puts Jesus Christ out here and says, that's who you're aiming at, rather than saying, look at me, you know, from a big chess guy. You know? Exactly, exactly. He's trying to displace some of that, but he's, he's really strongly identifying, I believe, with his audience, with, with his secondary audience. He is, he is very human in this moment. Go ahead, Lamar. I think you can make it also abundantly clear who's who in the conversation so that down the road like us, we, we won't miss this. That's right. He's laying it out very succinctly, very That's clearly. Right. This is how this works. If you swap that, if you change that from saying Jesus Christ to me, it, it does sound a little self-inflating then, doesn't it? This doesn't. This, at, this creates a complete transparency and humility and is one of the things it accomplishes. And it also eliminates everybody that's not Jesus Christ. That's right. More importantly. That's right. Saying? So nobody could, could monkey with this and change the meaning of it he has identified himself for all time, exactly. period. Yeah, good. Okay, so there's, there's a lot of reasons that we, that we may see this. Now, there's another thing that's important here, and that is that there's the tense here in verse 3. Jesus says, this is eternal life. Not this will be your eternal life. This is eternal life. It's present. It's present perfect. And we've seen this over and over again. This is not something to be thought of just as a future thing. Eternal life is something that once given starts now. It doesn't mean that perfection has been achieved. It, it just means that atonement has been received. You see the difference? Not that perfection has been achieved but that atonement has been received. That's, that's the important thing. Okay. Verse 4, Jesus says that I have, he has brought glory to God by completing his mission. I brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And, and as we read through that, we noticed this is, this is before the crucifixion. What incredible commitment he demonstrates as he overlooks that in saying that my job here is done. He burned his own bridge. He sure did. He had no backing out, that's for sure. Verse 5, Jesus now prays that his original glory be restored. And he doesn't just want to be recognized for what he is about to do. He wants people to recognize and remember where he was at the beginning of all of this, before he left heaven, before he descended, before he was humiliated in becoming human. This goes all the way back to the opening words of the book. 
In the beginning was the Word. And that's what Jesus wants us to think about. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And through Him all things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. That's the glory that Jesus wants to be restored. And the reason he wants that to be restored is because of the glory that brings to his Father. Yeah, I, I got a little addition there to it. I noticed you jumped over whom you have sent. Three, whom you have sent? Yeah. Have sent. Uh -huh. That reinforces glorifying God. It was God's choice to send, and God did what he had to do to reconcile man. Right. And yep. I think that brings. It's all about finding that purpose and how what Jesus is doing is aimed back at God. And that's part, that's part of the way that verses 3, 4, and 5 sort of amplify what he said in verses 1 and 2. Yes. Yes. So this is all God's purpose. And that's why the glory isn't for Jesus to enjoy. It's for God. That's, that's why. Yes. But not only as Jesus says this in verse 5. This is an important one. Jesus says this in verse 5 to take us back to prehistory. Okay, he wants to take us back to the very beginning. But also, when Jesus says this in verse 5, he's also looking ahead to the end of this prayer. Now I want you to jump down to verse 24 right now and see where this thing is going because it's going to end with this same theme of Jesus being glorified again as he was before his incarnation. Okay, and what he's going to ask for in verse 24, listen, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, to experience my glory, the glory you have given me because you love me before the creation of the world. Jesus is going to end this prayer by asking not only that he be glorified, but that his disciples enjoy that with him. Wow. Now that's one of those points. Imagine being there. And hearing Jesus appeal to his father, I want you to be with me in this place and in this, in this moment when this happens. Wow. If ever their mind was blown, yeah. it's going to be blown right here. Yeah, I think they have nothing to say at the end of this prayer. No. Because it, it, it's just, it's, it's beyond their pay grade. <laughs> Way beyond, okay? So that's where this thing is going immediately. Now, the question I asked you as we headed, are we almost done? As we headed into verses one through five, my first question was, what keeps this prayer from being selfish? Well, number one, it's that any glory that he receives is immediately deflected back to his father, okay? But then secondly, not only is he wanting to glorify his father, he wants to share this experience with all of them and with us. That's where this thing is headed. He wants it to be a shared, joined experience. Wow, is that ever cool. All right, six through 10. We've got to move here. <laughs> I don't know how to do this fast. There's no way to do it you fast. <laughs> you just can't. In verses six through 10, Jesus' prayer now shifts. And where he's going to go is he's going to start looking at the specific needs of his disciples. And he starts out in chapter six or in chapter 17, verse 6, with a progress report. And he's going to tell his father what his disciples have done, where they've come from, and where they are now in their faith walk. Because we know that they are, they're challenged at times. But nonetheless, and, and here's the thing, I want, I want to plant this seed for you before we get into it. The seed here is that we often are very critical of these guys because they don't have all the faith they need at various points on the journey, okay? But we're sort of comparing them with who they're going to be down the road. That's kind of an unfair comparison. The comparison we need to think about is think about how different they are from their, from their contemporaries from the guys walking around in Judaism and also seeing Jesus, but failing to make the comprehension and the dedication that, that these guys do. Lamar? Because God knows all things, he knows everything Jesus is saying. Do you think maybe Jesus said it like this for the benefit of the disciples? 
since this is a prayer of encouragement for them to show them not only how much they've grown, yeah. but how much confidence he has in them. Absolutely. And, and, and that's why he prays for them. He needs, he needs to ask God this, and he wants, to, he wants to focus God on this, I suppose. But in addition to that, he also uh, needs for himself to be, fo to be um, just to be sure that this is where, where it's going and so that they will hear it and they will understand. Yes, absolutely. This is one of those moments where this is the public nature of this prayer is, is important, okay? And so let's read 6 through 10 and think about if you're hearing him say this stuff about you. Just think about this, okay? Here's what Jesus says about his disciples. Starting verse 6. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. What a pat on the back that is. After he's just told them, you're all going to leave me. You're all going to abandon me. And that's, what he, that's how he you know, sort of ended uh, the next, next to the last thing that he said in chapter 16 was, you're all going to leave me alone. And I'm going to be there only with my father. But he knows that their faith, even though it's not where it needs to be, it's enough. He knows it's that mustard seed. He knows that they've got what they need to move forward. And in 48 to 72 hours, their lives are going to, they're, they're, they're going to be on quite a toboggan ride. It's going to go way downhill, and then it's going to go way up again. But these words are going to carry them from now on. That's right. They're going to, they're going to reflect on this. And they're going to remember when they are facing whatever they have to face, and they had to face a lot. They're going to remember at that moment, they're going to remember Jesus said, I was one of his. And he said that I believed him and that I knew that he came from God. I think I'm going to go through this. It'll be all right. That's right. It will be all right. Okay. So. He begins in verse 6, and I, I really need to finish this, this section. Um, he begins in verse 6 by describing these disciples as those his father had given him. So they were originally, these were his father's disciples. And Jesus had revealed to them uh, his father. And the NIV says in verse 6, I have revealed you. Again, most of the more literal translations say, I have revealed your name. Um, and that's probably a little bit better. What, what the name of God means is God's character. God, Jesus has revealed to them who God is and what he's like. Okay, and they've understood that. Uh, how had they responded according to verse 6? To that message. They obeyed. They, obeyed. they had obeyed his word. Is what, the, is what Jesus says. And, and he goes on to express his confidence in them. Okay? Now in verses 7 and 8, Jesus describes the level of faith they have sort of gotten to. Verse 7 says they now attribute everything Jesus has, everything Jesus does, is from the Father. It's the Father's will that's, that's being fulfilled here. Verse 8 says they have accepted the words of Jesus. That doesn't mean they've always understood them, but they've accepted them. And, and, and they're learning that in time I will understand this, okay? But I can trust it. And that's the important thing, is that I can trust him even if I don't see it clearly yet. Go ahead, Craig. You notice also in the beginning of the eighth year, for I gave them the words you gave me. Right. That's right. Yeah, he's made. A, we've seen that throughout this book. That's been one of the emphases of the entire book is that Jesus does nothing that comes on his own. 
everything is uh, authorized um, by his father. Everything comes with the authority of his father. Okay? Um, verse 8 also says that they now believe with certainty that Jesus was God's servant, that Jesus was God's agent, that Jesus was doing God's work. They believed, and it doesn't, he doesn't just leave it and say they believed it. He says they believed with certainty. He wants to be sure that we get the full picture there, right? Okay. Um, verses 9 and 10, now Jesus explains why he is praying for them as he's talking again to his Father. And the answer is that his disciples belong to God. They are yours, is what he said. And it's interesting because it would be easy to say, I want to ask these things for the disciples because I want them to be successful in the mission. But that's not what he says. He says, the reason I'm praying for them is because they belong to you. It's all about the relationship they have with their father. The mission is important, but it's secondary. The primary thing is how they are related to God. It's the, you know, their identity is not, in God's eyes, his worker bees. Their identity is his children in relationship with him. That's the difference. Okay? And so, as we've, as we've read through chapters 14 through 16, and we read all of those things that Jesus had, had talked to them about and told them about, he's described this relationship between them and their father. He said this relationship is one that's, first of all, based on love. He said it's based on intimacy. Remember, he said, I don't call you friends. I don't call you servants anymore. I call you friends because I told you everything. It's based on intimacy. It's based on disclosure. It's about sharing things. It's about obedience. If you love me, it's about faith. It's about joy. It's about fruitfulness. It's about peace. These are the things that Jesus has talked to them about, and that's what their relationship. When Jesus says here uh, in verse 9, you, are, you belong to him, um, or he says, they are yours, as he speaks to his father, he says, they are yours. He's talking about those features. He's talking about that type of a bond, that type of a relationship. The beginning of verse 10, Jesus and the father share everything. And again, this, this is something that John has emphasized throughout the whole book, that, that they, they have everything in common. But this is also another seed that Jesus is planting. Because he's going to go, he's going to talk later on in this prayer, and he's going to talk about the need for unity. And unity is based on sharing things and sharing everything. And that's where this is heading. He's going he's to lay that seed, and it's going to grow up when we get to verse uh, 11, and then especially in the section between verses 20 and 23. And then in the final part of verse 10, Jesus says, they have brought glory to me. I have received glory from them. How, do, how have they received glory? How has he received glory from them? I guess is the question. How has Jesus received glory from them? By their obedience. By the change in their lives. The transformation. You know, this is, that's what the gospel is all about. Remember when we, we looked at the story of uh, ch Jesus changing water to wine? And we made the point there, this is not really about changing physical elements. This is about Jesus' ability to transform lives. And that's what this is really getting at here. He's talking about, these guys have brought me glory. They used to be fishermen and tax collectors and, and zealots. Singers. Yes, and, well, they're still sinners. <laughs> but they, aren't, they weren't forgiven sinners. And, 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 and that's all going to change. The transformation that occurred in these guys was remarkable and incredible. And so what has happened here is that that brings glory to God. And then once again, this is, this is something, it's not a one-time 
does it, this glorification? This glorification is again described in a present perfect tense, which means this glorification is continuing. And, and, and it just says that what they do and who they are continues to bring glory to God. And this is only going to get stronger as their teaching ministry grows, as their, as their emphasis on the building of the church grows in the first century. Um, all of those things are going to be, bring greater and greater and greater glory back to Jesus. They're going to reflect him. And so that is, what, that is the prelude that Jesus gives us before he starts into the specific request that he makes for his people. And he's going to request for their preservation and protection. He's going to make a request for their sanctification. And then he's going to make a request for unity and unification. Okay, And all those things are going to be important. But right now, Jesus has just been setting the stage for that. And he's been pointing out that these guys are in it. They have done as much as we could have expected at this point in time. And so, um, once again, don't forget how encouraging that had to be to sit there or stand there, or whatever the posture was, I don't know, um, but to experience Jesus speaking to his Father about me. You know, wow. the, way he, the way he talked to God, was also extremely evident in their minds that this is different than anything they ever heard. Yeah. So he's, he's letting them know in another way, this is it, guys. Yeah. This is all there is. Yeah. You know, another thought that came to mind, and I'm going to steal a little bit of your thunder from 11, because <laughs> after all that he just said about them, he asked God to protect them with the power of his name, like he does me. So he's actually just handing them off to God and saying, Hey guys, everything you've seen up until this point that the Father has done through me, this same power now is going to take care of you. Their experience to this point has largely been physical. Yeah. There's going to be this huge transition now as everything moves from the physical to the spiritual. Yeah. And, and, and this, this spirit-led uh, spirit power that they're going to experience from the Holy Spirit but also knowing that the Father is intimately involved with them as he, as he talked in the, the tail end of the farewell discourse and Jesus pointed out to them, I don't, you don't need me in this middle place anymore. You will talk directly to your Father. Um, and, and so there's all of this physical relationship is in the process of morphing into something that will last forever. And so it's an incredible window into, uh, into the gospel. One last thought, Greg? Um, I, I just need to be careful not to look at them as just them, because it's us as well. You know, we're bringing glory, and we will bring glory. Black, you know, all have gone. No one comes out of the Father except through me, so we're all yeah. going through Him, and He's taking us and passing that glory on, the glorification of the Him that's passing on God. There, there are a lot of points of contact where we can all be included in these these wishes, these concerns, these these ideas that Jesus is sharing. But not all of them. Some of them are exclusively for that audience. He's going to expand his audience when we get down to verse 20. And, and things will, will shift there. And it very clearly shifts when Jesus says, I now pray for all of those who will believe me through their message, through their word. Okay, and so that, that clearly includes everybody else. So there's, there's certainly points of contact, but perhaps not the whole. I, I think we have to be viewed as a secondary audience in this part of the prayer. Right. But th 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 this is really focused on them. It's not to say that some of it might still apply to us, and it does. But not all of it. And, and the primary focus is on that. Anyhow, uh, God is good. All the time. All the time.